Thank you so much for being here. Uh, my name is Brian Steed. I'm the executive director of the Janet Quinney Lawson Institute for Land, Water, and Air here at Utah State. Uh, we will have a much more broad presentation a little bit later regarding Bear Lake, but before getting in there, I uh, wanted to, to do some brief uh, welcome and introductions. So uh, the Institute is a little over a year old now being fully staffed. Uh, being fully staffed means two full-time individuals and, uh, well, actually, yeah, still about two, yeah. Uh, and two part-time individuals, uh, and uh, we are so grateful for, for working with so many of you during the last year. As you might notice uh, by the uh, diversity of individuals here in this room, we've got a lot of different research interests because when you t do something that's as broad as land, water, and air, there is a bunch of opportunities to work together and cross campus. And that's one of the joys of the Institute. It's also one of the challenges of the Institute, which is why we host things like this, so that we can bring people together to talk about how we can work together on these bigger projects. I want to make one more introduction uh, before he slides away is Devin Weiser, who's the Vice President of Government and External Relations. Devin, good to see you. Let's talk about what we're doing with the Institute, because I know that the, for some of you, this is the first time we've interacted. Our mission with the Institute is to guide Utah land, water, and air policy by connecting decision makers with high quality research. In truth, uh, in an office that's the size of uh, three, I guess now three full-time individuals and two part-time individuals, we really can't do a lot of the research and so therefore we're relying on you all uh, who are the brain trust of not only what I would argue is this university but also of the state. And those state lawmakers and others and, and honestly those at the federal level as well have real need to understand what we're doing and how they can better improve uh, policy with the data that, that you're all gathering. So how this works, um, there's oftentimes we use this Venn diagram where we have land, water, and air researchers sometimes that aren't necessarily always talking with or connecting with Utah policymakers and other leaders, uh, and that's the role of the Institute. And that Venn diagram to have that overlap and see that we can't uh, bring people together to have a more informed policy discussion on the various challenges we face in the land, water, and airspace, statewide, nationwide, and I would argue globally, uh, back to, to Shannon's point. Uh, so we really appreciate the collaboration that we have felt uh, from you all, and uh, really appreciate all that you've been doing. Uh, one thing uh, that would invite you all to be part of uh, is that we try to have uh, newsletters go out. We have a faculty newsletter that goes out monthly. We also have a weekly newsletter, which is essentially a digest, a reader's digest version of, of the major news stories. So it's a, we're essentially doing a clip service uh, to see where the major land, water, and air stories are uh, from local media sources and some national as well, and then presenting that in a cogent format to as many people as we can. Our list right now is about 2,500 people. Uh, what I would ask for you as well as you do research and are publishing research that has impact on land, water, and air, one of the things we've been asked to do as part of this is to also highlight some of those research findings uh, and get that in front of a broader audience than uh, otherwise might be the case. So that's something that I'd invite you to participate. If you're not on the newsletter um, list yet, please join. Uh, and just so you know what we've been doing in 2023, uh, we uh, have been increasing the support to faculty and students uh, we have given five, four, five, six, six great. Uh, six uh, impact grants. Um, Illwa impact grants are at the, at the sum of uh, $15,000. We were able to, to take some of the money that we've had and really do, um, I, I don't know if it's called seed grants or what would it be, but it's, it's stuff that you may not be able to get uh, really fast uh, at the time. I mean, Randy was one of the early recipients of that. Randy, do you want to tell people what you're working on on, on yours? Uh, that was uh, a study we did looking at ammonia in the Cache Valley. Uh, one of the ammonia sources, one of the main ammonia sources went down, it was a closure facility. And so we wanted to see what effect that unforced remediation had on the ammonia in the Cache Valley and then how it formed particles in our and for those that weren't paying attention, bird flu came through, wiped out, oh, a little over a million birds. 1.4 million birds. Uh, in, in that facility, and it gives this really amazing natural experiment that's really time sensitive, and we're able to provide funding for that so that we're able to get a better insight on how we have, I think what Randy's termed the ammonia volcano, uh, 
the even with that block, there's still the highest ammonia in the country, so yay for us. <laughs> Congratulations, we're all part of that. Uh, but that's the sort of stuff that we're doing, uh, as well as working with students and, and giving some student support. We were also able to get an additional pledged million dollar grant from um, the Rangasan Foundation and Judy Endowment, or Judy Rangasan as well. Right? To Matt and to John, who uh, helped facilitate that, uh, thank you so much, but it's a million dollar pledge. This will provide, when it's fully vested, about $40,000 per year uh, for undergraduate research and some graduate research as well in the area primarily of water, uh, but not exclusively of water. Um, and he very much wants to work uh, with uh, economics and other things because he has this very different background, which is kind of cool. So something to look forward to, and so we're looking at that. Um, USU programming and involvement, we've been working uh, trying to get more community facility or community um, events here on campus so we can build uh, the academic community together. Uh, we've been having uh, certain events. We had one on the Colorado River as well as one on uh, energy, uh, but also uh, we ha hosted um, uh, Native American uh, rights talk on, on how Native Americans are managing uh, environmental issues and some other uh, interesting things to the community. We expect to do more of these in the upcoming year and uh, look forward to your participation therein. And then lastly, we've been engaging quite heavily on Great Salt Lake issues. Uh, if you're looking at the consummate land, water, and air issue of the state, look no further than the Great Salt Lake, where the way we use our land impacts how much water we have, how much water we have in the lake impacts air quality, uh, particularly through, uh, through dust particles. Um, uh, and so that's what we're trying to figure out is how we can best get involved and provide the best data. To that end, we helped formulate the Great Salt Lake Strike Team last year. Uh, special thanks to all those who participated, especially uh, David Tarbotten, who's one of the co-chairs, uh, and trying to provide the best data and science to policymakers. Uh, that all involvement also landed me a second gig, yay, uh, as, the, uh, as the Great Salt Lake Commissioner uh, which I'm doing on the side, uh, but that also will involve you all to some degree because one of the things they wanted uh, my engagement and my involvement in this is because they very much want to use as much brain trust of, of the universities as they can. So we still haven't cracked that nut of how that's going to work, but it's something that we can, uh, we can talk about. And I think we were talking uh, to Dean Baker earlier about some of those things that there might be further funding opportunities through that side of the house as well. So, um, Projects and partnerships, um, we have been working uh, with any number of, of uh, individuals trying to get better engagement statewide. Uh, we've received state support with an investment from the Utah State Legislature. We've been uh, promised a gift from Rio Tinto. Um, we have been working very much with um, the GSL strike team this year as well, trying to figure out additional policy implication questions and love to talk to you all more about that later. Uh, and we will continue to do ELWA impact grants um, and other things. So we very much look forward to working with you all. Rather than uh, go on and on, uh, we had promised a discussion on our latest opportunity, which is on Bear Lake. Uh, so one of the things that we, we focused on during last year's legislative session with our local legislator, uh, Senator Chris Wilson, he was interested in, in the Bear Lake. Bear Lake is one of those bodies of water that's not listed as, as thoroughly impaired. Uh, and so as, as such, it doesn't receive as much um, uh, attention as some of the other bodies of water in the state, namely, if you're looking at Great Salt Lake, everyone knows there's a crisis there. If you're looking at Utah Lake, there has long been a crisis there. Uh, and so Bear Lake is one of those things that just kind of says, yeah, we're great, we're, we're glad that it exists. The legislature is very interested in making sure that it exists in the same quality uh, and, and quantity that it has existed heretofore. And so one of the things they wanted us to engage on is specifically on this issue, and they were able to uh, put together uh, $313,000 for this project, and Anna is gonna tell you more about that. So Anna, please. Thank you. So if you were watching me during introductions, you'll notice that I had just a stupid grin on my face because um, in my many years working in research here at the university, these types of gatherings are gold to me, um, just the idea that we have a chance to 
meet in more interdisciplinary groups and maybe with people and faces that we're less familiar with. Uh, this is the type of thing that made me move over from the research office to the institute is to be able to facilitate more projects like this. Um, and the Bear Lake project is one that, out of all of the things we've done with the institute, that I am by far most excited about because of the types of outcomes that I think that we're going to receive from this. So that's where I'm gonna start is the reason that I'm excited about this Bear Lake project. So what, by the end of this year, what I am hoping that we will have in addition to a number of great research results is a community of experts who know each other, know each other's work, are working together, um, that have gone through a shared experience where we have received um, information from same but diverse stakeholders, where we've had a chance to talk together and we've created a shared understanding of what the broad issues are on Bear Lake and not just in our individual areas. Um, and by doing that, creating, I hate the word synergy, but that's exactly what it is, a, a, a level of increasing returns that we would get that's beyond what, uh, what we receive from individual research projects and research grants by working on something in a big way all together. Um, Brian already touched on, generally, why Bear Lake. I'll just add a couple things on this. Um, I'm excited because I have a fair amount of emotional connection to Bear Lake, as I think most of us do who, uh, who have lived in Cache Valley with any period of time. Um, I was just going through and just geolocating my Google photos so I could pull some of the landscape photos for this presentation. And just going back and realizing the amount of time that I have spent recreating up at Bear Lake and those of my friends, neighbors, family who have value in that area, um, that's one reason that I'm excited to work on it. I know that Brian touched on our other large water bodies in the state. So uh, Bear Lake is the third largest natural lake, the fourth largest water body in the state, and the other three ahead of it get a whole lot of attention. So Great Salt Lake daily, and not just in the state, but regionally, nationally, internationally, uh, we see stories and concern in media about uh, the potential problems and existing problems that we see on Great Salt Lake. Uh, Utah Lake has long been, at least in the state media, uh, with water quality issues and other development issues occurring there. Uh, Lake Powell with the challenges that we're seeing on Colorado River and the, uh, the declining elevation and its needs for supplying water in the southwest as well as uh, hydropower, um, that's something that we're all familiar with. And then we get to Bear Lake, which as Brian mentioned, is uh, uh, in some ways very positively uh, and mostly absent by the, by the media, but is definitely something that we as uh, state residents as well as researchers should keep our eye on so that we can keep it that way. Um, there are lots of challenges that need to be addressed on Bear Lake. Um, one of which is a management challenge. So just within the sovereign lands, just up to the beaches, there are a number of uh, state and federal agencies that have jurisdiction uh, on the lake. And then there's additional ones that have management oversight. And this is just on the Utah side of the lake. And so you can uh, multiply that by a factor more when you think about the fact that this lake spans over Utah and Idaho. Um, in addition to the management challenges, uh, Lots of people are unaware that the, even though Bear Lake is a natural lake, it's operating as a reservoir with the diverted Bear River keep uh, holding some of its uh, water during the year so that it can be uh, released to irrigate throughout the summer months. Uh, and that creates uh, additional uh, management considerations, additional stakeholders, additional challenges. Uh, and then if you have, tried to go up to Bear Lake this summer, you know that it is experienced a significant amount of recreation growth. Uh, the stats that I've read is a 300% increase in visitation over the past 10 years, and I found another report from 10 years ago that said that there was a 300% increase on the 10 years before that. So we're seeing this, this exponential curve of people who are wanting to be on the lake, and that pr brings problems of development, traffic, parking, uh, a lopsided economy that operates heavily during the summer and less during the winter, and a number of challenges with that. 
Uh, so uh, the Division of Forestry, Fire, and State Lands within the Utah Department of Natural Resources uh, last year completed a comprehensive management plan for Bear Lake. And I have it on some of your tables. It's, it's a thick 300-page book on uh, uh, an encyclopedic uh, summary of issues on the Bear Lake from its uh, ecological values to community challenges uh, of the sovereign lands that are on Bear Lake. Uh, it's a lot, and some of it's incredibly useful, some of it is a little bit more of a reference uh, guide, but the, uh, what happened was uh, to build on the momentum of the plan, uh, this additional funding has been to address some of the issues outlined in the comprehensive management plan. So we'll be working really closely with forestry, fire, and state lands uh, with the idea of a needs assessment. Uh, as I went through the comprehensive management plan, I found 40 significant and explicit research questions that they said to be able to make better management decisions on the lake, we need to know more about this, this, or this, which we'll talk about in a minute. And so that's why uh, the needs assessment uh, came to fruition and we're excited to get started on it. There's gonna be three parts to this needs assessment. The first one is one that's going to be managed by the Institute, which is a needs assessment report, uh, which is uh, providing some consulting and uh, expertise on uh, management and coordination issues, policy issues, creating a distillation of the report itself so that it can be used as a management tool. Second, which I hope is why you're all here today, is the research grant program, which will provide 150,000 in grants and funding for faculty, graduate students, and undergraduate students to be able to answer some of those research uh, questions on the lake. And then third, which is one that I am really excited uh, for in my background is an outreach program, which is the process in which we will bring researchers and stakeholders together to be able to magnify the, uh, the communication, the impact, the coordination of these, uh, of everyone who's going to be focusing on the lake this year. And that's one that I'm, uh, I am, I think that will create, I don't know, the secret sauce for this program to make it something that's really valuable and special. Uh, so, for the research program itself, uh, here's the way that we've been working on to be able to run it to make sure that uh, it works well, both internally and externally, for our partners. Uh, what we are going to do is it's our plan to provide a, a, a number of faculty grants, up to 15,000. We know that these are small, but we want to make sure that we have broad participation. Graduate research grants or assistantships, up to 20,000 undergraduate research grants up to 1,500, and class cohort projects uh, up to 3,000. And that would be a, a, a faculty member who wants to have an entire st uh, student group or class spend their semester focusing on some project or issues surrounding Bear Lake. Uh, if we just barely launched today our Bear Lake webpage, and that has all of the information that I'm going to be going through today, um, what's on your sheet, as well as the things that I'm going to be running through here. So that's up and available just from our Institute website. Uh, and so I'm going to just briefly touch on uh, what uh, types of research questions could be addressed that are uh, explicitly stated in the comprehensive management plan. So there are a number of questions surrounding Bear Lake water quantity and flow. That includes inflows, outflows, groundwater, um, threats to the limnology of the lake. There are questions about the lake's water quality, uh, the chemistry. There's been a number of discussions, especially among key stakeholders on the lake, that want to do, make sure that whatever can be done to preserve the uh, Caribbean turquoise color of the lake is, uh, is done so, so that's part of it. Um, storm water is another area of water quality that has been brought up. For land and sediment, uh, there's been a, a lot of discussion about the changes that have been seen on the beaches surrounding the lake, uh, sediment filtration from the wetlands on the north side of the lake, uh, mineral uh, and rare earth uh, deposits up on the north side in Mud Lake. Uh, plant life questions. Uh, a lot of questions surrounding the uh, occurrence and eradication of invasive species, 
wetlands, phytoplankton. Uh, in wildlife and habitat, uh, a lot of the questions surrounded the endemic fish species, but there's also been questions around mollusks, amphibians, because they don't know what's there, uh, as well as some bird species as well. There is a need for some work on data and visualization, uh, different ways to conceptualize and uh, visualize the changing lake elevation, uh, and maybe different uh, metrics to understand resources on the lake, including recreation, fish, wetlands. Um, that's a fairly open-ended question that we uh, found and re uh, received from forestry, fire, and state lands. Of course, outdoor recreation management is going to be key to addressing changes on the lake. Uh, the most notable research question was just understanding what the carrying capacity of the lake is. How many uh, recreators can you safely have on the lake at once on both motorized and non-motorized uh, vehicles, uh, but also figuring out how to manage that many new visitors to the lake. Uh, in environmental planning and transportation, parking, if you've been up there in the past few weeks, has been a huge is issue, especially on the south side of the lake. Uh, but there's a number of other questions as well, understanding the, uh, um, uh, some of the economic and environmental issues beyond the beach area, but with the uh, developing communities. And then sociology and survey research. There's a number of attitude and desire and interest uh, stakeholders that Forestry, Fire, and State Lands wants to have a better uh, understanding of. That includes recreators on the lake, part-time homeowners, full-time residents, and other stakeholders. And then finally, uh, communication, marketing, and outreach. There's a, the, uh, Forestry, Fire, and State Lands is under-resourced in their uh, ability to create response plans and marketing plans for being able to share their management messages or uh, their invasive species crisis plans, and that is an area that a student group or faculty member could work to address there. Uh, those are the ones that were included in this tome that's on these tables. Um, as I've been working with Ben Steyerman and others in the division, uh, they have specifically said that they are open to other research questions that they have not identified yet. Uh, and that includes those in all colleges. It includes, uh, and I checked with him specifically, it inc includes humanities as well. There were some uh, that we didn't write down that we talked about specifically. Uh, ben would not be uh, opposed to having a undergraduate student spend some time in special collections uh, this year and understanding what, what uh, uh, resources and assets we hold on historical information on Bear Lake. Uh, there is opportunity for art or photography uh, that could help augment uh, assets and materials for uh, Bear Lake uh, uh, communication that goes out from the division. Um, I'm gonna stop there for a second. I'm gonna jump into the requirements, criteria, and timeline, but are there any questions before I move forward so far? Okay, um, so to be, we've done, my background is in communications and I was really expecting to spend most of my time publicizing this grant, but we've done a fair amount just trying to figure out how to operate this grant. This is a little bit unique, it's first of its kind. Um, it's, it's a new thing for forestry, fire, and state lands, so we've been trying to figure out what that looks like, but we've got a, uh, a plan of attack now that's in the, this call for proposals. Um, the requirements for a grant proposal. One, it has to be related to Bear Lake or the surrounding areas. Um, two, um, we need to have a USU faculty member as the PI on all of these grants. That includes graduate student grants and undergraduate research grants. Um, and that's because that these are going to be submitted as external grants to forestry, fire, and state lands. Three, uh, with limited exceptions, the research needs to be feasibly able to be conducted within the academic year or at least by the end of next summer. Um, the funding that we received is funding that could theoretically be swept back, and so we need to have funds obligated by the end of the time that that, that, that funding has been allocated. Uh, for, for 
the reason that we're excited about this program is to create a community of experts. So for those who receive grant funding, there will be the, expert the expectation to participate in that community. I really believe that that's going to be a feature of this program. And then five, you have to submit a final report, uh, and one that can be used in a compendium that we return to the division and to the state legislature on the work that we've been do doing and the greater understanding that we have on the lake. Uh, the way that we are going to evaluate any proposals will be pretty simple. Uh, we will be evaluating based on the quality and scientific merit of the proposal, the potential impact that it could have on management decisions on Bear Lake, uh, alignment with research questions and the comprehensive management plan. As I mentioned, it's not required, but it does, uh, it does benefit. Uh, Matching funds are not required for this, but they will be viewed favorably. Uh, and then the other thing that matters is, uh, again, to create this interdisciplinary research program. We are going to work to make sure that we have a diversity of research uh, researchers, research topics, research disciplines uh, to create a truly interdisciplinary program. Uh, our timeline for this. Uh, the proposal port portal has opened today. You can log on to our website. It's a, it's a fairly simple pre-proposal submission through Qualtrics. It includes a one-page uh, project summary, a budget, a, a, a statement of impact on Bear Lake, uh, and, and a project timeline and team management structure. Uh, and so it shouldn't be too onerous to fill out. Um, and we will be accepting submissions through October 2nd. Uh, we will be meeting with Forestry, Fire, and State Lands to and so that we can quickly send out funding notifications on October 13th. Now, here's the thing. The, uh, all of these are external grants. They will have to be submitted through Kuali. Um, for those of you who are not set up on Kuali, uh, we've got Ethan here from Sponsored Programs. Wave hi, Ethan. We've been working with him on figuring out how to administer and man manage this. Uh, and so we will need to do all of the things, all of the rigor rigmarole that you have to do to submit something through Kuali. That includes your RFAS training, it includes your COI disclosures, it includes IRB, uh, IACUC uh, protocols. Uh, those things that need to be in place to be running an external grant. Uh, those are things that can be done in parallel before, after, um, any time in this process, but they do need to be submitted for those who do receive funding notifications by October 20th so that the funds can be released uh, expeditiously uh, with an anticipated date of November 1st. Um, with the idea of report completions largely being done June 1st, although that on a case-by-case -case basis, we will consider extension applications. Along with this timeline, there will be a whole outreach uh, a community plan. We will have a kickoff meeting, probably in October. We'll have a closing celebratory meeting, probably in May. Uh, we are planning to be heavily involved with sharing research results at USU's Spring Runoff Conference, uh, as well as other, uh, other opportunities during the legislative session. And so once we have those dates, we'll share those out. And those will not be uh, solely for uh, for those who receive grant funding, we're make, going to make it broadly available. We know that we've got participation of a number of classes that we hope will apply for the grant, but even if they don't get the grant, have committed to uh, be doing different projects on Bear Lake, and we are going to be as inclusive as we can with those who want to be a part of this broad research initiative. Uh, and it's something that I'm really excited for, and I hope you are too, uh, to be able to engage maybe in a more interdisciplinary fashion on something that matters uh, significantly in the state. Now, questions, thoughts, concerns, project that is highly time sensitive, either with class schedules or with 
summertime, early fall data collection, email me and we will have a conversation to figure out if there is pre-proposal funding available to be able to do that. And that's something that we'll just have to work out with forestry, fire, and state lands. And George, we're not saying no. Uh, what we're trying to do is obligate as much of the money that's been appropriated as we can, right? And, and generally speaking, that money has to be, uh, had to be uh, at least spoken for by the time June 30 rolls around. And uh, that's, that's the, the trick we're doing here. Uh, but Forestry Fire and State Lands has not been clear on the parameters if you wanted to carry that into the fall. We would totally make that case for you. But, uh, but I can't guarantee that they would say yes. Yeah. So it's the balance between making sure that we have a equitable and fair and transparent process for proposals while also being able to facilitate time sensitive projects. And we'll just work to balance that. Other questions, yeah. Target balance, um, like the faculty, graduate, undergraduate. I will tell you what the balance is, but I've been specifically not uh, uh, committing to them so that if we see uh, them shipped one way or the other, we have some flexibility. But the general budgeting budget would be for three to four faculty grants, uh, four to five uh, graduate grants. 12 to 15 undergraduate research grants and three cohort, class cohort grants, two to three class cohort grants. So th that's. Let's, yeah, be very clear on this that we will make the case if we have a different balance. Yes. Um, the other thing that's coming into play, which we have not figured out, is we have a few other entities that are interested in adding to the research pot. Um, Notably, uh, Bear Lake Watch is one who has been very interested on certain science questions. And so rather than run a separate grant program, I think what they're interested in doing is uh, adding to the pot for specific research questions, which is a little bit wonky, but we are trying to work to make sure that, that we can get the most leverage out of this grant program as possible. And we may see some others as well. There's a few. Uh, potential additional funders that we've had conversations with. And they may come in as separate opportunities or as um, just adding to this particular grant program, which hopefully will add our capacity. Yeah. In, in the Qualtrics form, there is a list of exclusionary things. It doesn't cover tuition and fees. It doesn't cover course buyouts. Um, there are a few others that we had on there, travel to professional conferences. The other thing that I didn't mention that is in this call for proposals is it also has to include 10% F&A, even the undergraduate research grants. The budget that at least it's not 46. It's true. And, and it is what it is, and there's, there's meat there, too. Yeah. For uh, department heads and college deans, the FNA will be distributed to the grantees' college department distribution models. In other words, we're not taking a cut. Okay. What else? Yeah. Can the PI apply for the faculty grants at the same time as class cohort? Yes. Okay. Yep. And, and we would expect that to be a common practice. I mean, it's not required, but certainly if that's the way it is, that's great. So this is the soft launch. This is just the start to get the word out on this, start to make this idea that we've had for a while real. Uh, we will continue to have additional meetings. We'll be talking about it at department head retreat. Uh, we'll be sending out additional emails. We know that there are many people that are not here, not around, not available to chat about it now. But for those of you who are, we just didn't want to slam this on you on the first week of the semester. So we wanted to give a fair amount of time to think about it in advance. Um, so all of it doesn't have to be done 
in September. And I'll just throw in as well that we know that this is not a comprehensive list of people that might be interested. We'd ask you to talk to your colleagues as well uh, and get the word out because ultimately, I think more more of that spread of information is helpful and it helps us build a, a, a larger group of individuals who we can then draw from. What I mean by draw from, let me be clear about that too. Our hope is this is not a one and done. Our hope is that this can turn into something that where we can then go back to the legislature and say there is real need for more information and please help us to fund these either projects on the Bear Lake or other types of projects that we're able to then say, here is how we do this. Um, as such, it's a bit of an experiment. I get that. Uh, and I also understand that this is, I'll just say it, it's not how we would have rolled this out. Uh, there's been a fair amount of negotiation with the state agency involved here on what they perceive their needs are. Uh, but uh, we're excited to get it going and see how we, uh, how we end up. They're going to be good partners on this, though. They, so. they absolutely are. We're really excited to work with them. What else? Or anything, any questions you have about Institute in general? It doesn't have to be on the Bear Lake project. Or anything else. We want to talk about it. It's great. I can tell you one more thing that I'm excited about. Uh, so one other project that we've been working on that Brian didn't mention is we have been partnered with the Governor's Office of Economic Opportunity on the Air and Water Innovation Grant. And so we have been listed as an evaluator on those uh, who have received the grant. And this is not a research grant, it's a business and nonprofit grant. So uh, businesses have submitted proposals to the state on how they can change their processes or adopt new processes to be more efficient in their water or their uh, air or water quality quantity or uh, air quality. And uh, so out of there were 10 pilot grants awarded last year, and uh, nine of them chose, there were three potential evaluators, nine of them chose the Institute for Land, Water, and Air to be their evaluators. Um, and it's been really, really exciting working with uh, uh, these organizations. They include teeny tiny startups to very large companies like uh, Thanksgiving Point Institute and Sweets Candies, and uh, what we are planning to do is to, one thing that's interesting is none of the grantees know each other. They don't even know who they are. And uh, many of them are really interested in getting some feedback on the uh, quality of the work that they're trying to do. So we're going to be putting together a meeting or maybe a symposium this fall to connect those organizations with each other, but we will also be inviting experts in the areas that they're working on to be a part of the uh, Q&A or evaluative process that will likely come with compensation to faculty members who are a part of those evaluating committees. We're just working out the, the pieces of that. So that's another project that we are excited to roll out in the fall. Yes. <laughs> okay, so uh, you'll indicate the grant type. It's researcher info, and then we have a max of four additional researchers. So this will be the faculty PI, and then undergraduate or graduate researchers can be added to this. Uh, oh. We're not putting our fingers on the scale here. <laughs> Okay, so then it will add another researcher. Okay, and then we'll ask you to include a project title and then address any of the questions that, uh, that you are answering in the CMP or other if it's not, and that's fine too. And it'll just drill down. Uh, and so this is just pulling up what were in those categories. And then you put in a uh, project summary, 500 words. It, I don't have it validated. If it's 600 words, it will be fine. Um, don't tell people that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
how do you anticipate that your project will inform management decisions? How will your project team be structured, meaning who's going to do the work? Uh, what's your main activities and the timeline you plan to accomplish those? Uh, and after that, it's a upload of a budget and If you have a management plan, what is that management plan? Here's the budget section. I don't have that validated, so put in what you're gonna put in, but um, if you have matching funds, what is their amount and sources? Uh, your budget spreadsheet, it's gonna make me put a thing in. Let's put in an image. I know. <laughs> okay, so then we've got any additional, these are just optional attachments or considerations, anything that you want to say that we didn't ask you, and then you'll have to agree to um, submitting through Kuali, invoicing, you know, submitting your reimbursement, submit a final report, and that's it. So we're not the NSF. Uh, <laughs> well, then you have to do quality if you're funded, and that is a whole other thing, but that's Ethan's problem, and less my problem. Please use quality if you want to figure out your budget. Talk to me. We have Excel spreadsheets that, are, that mimic quality. Nothing mimics quality. Is, um, and it has updates all the time that has the exact numbers so you can formulate your budget. So please, if you'd like to use quality, if it's really simple and it's really easy. Um, you can reach out to me. Uh, many of your colleges and departments have people um, who are more than happy to help you. And yeah, so I don't, if you want to just look me up, I'm on the SPO website. I'm right there. So yeah, send me a message or talk to anybody in your colleges about that stuff. Yep. So, it, I mean, it takes a second to come up with your research idea, but we're trying to make it as simple as possible, especially knowing that there will be a number of undergraduates submitting, we hope, and so something simple for them as well. All right. Yes, oh, yeah. So I just want to verify real quick. So going through Kuali is, you have to do that conditional on or like after you've been accepted, or is that to even submit? No, so all you have to do is submit the Qualtrics. And then if you get a funding notification to receive the funding from Forestry, Fire, and State Lands, because it will be a grant coming directly from their division, that will have to be submitted through Kuali. So you can take a long time to do it, but then we're not going to disperse funds by our target of November 1st. Awesome. Anything else? Thank you, thank you for being here. We appreciate it.